Hello, I am Indu Dogra and today I am going to talk to you about the origin and development of tragedy in ancient Greece. Ancient Greek tragedy was a wonderful mixture of myth, legend, philosophy, social commentary, poetry, dance, music, public participation and visual splendor. It will be very interesting to study where from such a rich tradition of theatre originated. To explore this one needs to go back to primitive times. William Ridgway in his article Solar Myths, Tree Spirits and Totems discusses James Fraser's hypothesis and his doctrine of totemism pointing out that the latest theory of the origin of tragedy is based on his doctrine that vegetation spirits and totem animals are the primary phenomena. A further fundamental principle of his vegetation spirit doctrine is the assumption that Dionysus, Demeter, Osiris, Adonis and Attis and such like personages that appear in Greek mythology had never been human individuals but always wine, corn and other vegetation abstractions. Sir James Fraser makes dramatic performance arise in the dramatization of the seasons by primitive men. He opines that the spectacle of the great changes which annually pass over the face of the earth has powerfully impressed the minds of men in all ages and stirred them to meditate on causes of changes so vast and wonderful. The curiosity of primitive men is justified for even the savage cannot fail to see perfectly how intimately his own life is bound up with the life of nature and how the same processes which freeze the stream and strip the earth of vegetation also threaten him with extinction. At a certain stage of development, men may seem to have imagined that the means of averting the threatened calamity were in their own hands and they could help or hasten or retard the flight of the seasons by magic art. Accordingly, they performed ceremonies and recited spells believing that they are helping to make the rain fall, the sun to shine, animals to multiply and the fruits of the earth to grow. In the course of time, the slow advance of knowledge which has dispelled many cherished illusions convinced at least the more thoughtful portion of mankind that the alteration of summer and winter, of spring and autumn were not merely the result of their own magical rites, but that some deeper cause, some mightier power was at work behind the shifting scenes of nature. They now picture to themselves the growth and decay of vegetation, the birth and death of living creatures as effects of the waxing or waning strength of divine beings, of gods and goddesses who were born and died, who married and begot children on the pattern of human life. Dear students, 
Thus, the old magical theory of the seasons was displaced or rather supplemented by a religious theory. For although men now attributed the annual cycle of change primarily to corresponding changes in their deities, they still thought that by performing certain magical rites, they could aid the god who was the principle of life in his struggle with the opposing principle of death. They imagined that they could recruit his failing energies and even raise him from the dead. The ceremonies which they observed for this purpose were in substance a dramatic representation of the natural processes which they wished to facilitate. You know, it is a familiar tenet of magic that you can produce any desired effect by merely imitating it. So, they now explained the fluctuations of growth and decay, of reproduction and dissolution, by the marriage, the death and the rebirth of the gods, mainly of god Dionysus. Their religious or rather magical dramas dwelt on in great measure on these themes. They set forth the fruitful union of the powers of fertility, the sad death of at least one of the divine partners and his joyful resurrection. Thus, a religious theory was blended with a magical practice. It has been pointed out that magic is a stage prior to religion. Therefore, it is quite obvious that men began to dramatize natural phenomena long before dramatizing human life. Friends, an important question can be asked here. Does the presence of tombs and burial rituals in so many Greek plays point at anything important? It has been suggested that it points to a time when they were acted at royal funerals, telling the story of the king's great deeds in the same way as the Egyptians commemorated the lives of their pharaohs in paintings on the mummy cases. The Greeks honored their old chiefs with sacrifices and tragic dances for the same reason as those for which ancestors, heroes and saints have been and are still being worshipped in Western Asia. India, Burma, China, Japan and in a word in almost every corner of the world. A good king in his life was supposed to bring all sorts of prosperity to his people. While conversely it was thought that under a bad king the earth refused her increase. When a great and good chief dies all is not over yet. His spirit is supposed to have the same tastes and passions in death as he had in life. Within his grave, he still thinks of his family and people. And if they, in turn, still think of him and refresh his vital element with libations, best of all human blood, he will keep sleepless watch help them in hour of peril and use his kindly influence with earth to make it increase the yield and to make fruitful the herds, flocks and women of his tribe. What the great king is supposed to do for his tribe, the rude forefathers of each humble family are supposed to do for their kin in a lesser degree. Ancient Greece supplies striking instances of the use of dances to honor the dead. For example, at Athens on the third day of Anthesteria, 
which is a very ancient festival of the dead. Pots of cooked vegetables were offered to the gods and to the dead and circular dances were performed similar to those held on solemn occasions at this hour in India and elsewhere. Dead saints and martyrs who have suffered much in life are supposed to be pleased by having their woes kept in continual remembrance after death. The Heracles saga is a typical example. So the ancient practice of placating gods and heroes by sacrifices and celebrations led to ecstatic dancing and singing. These songs were delivered by dancing choruses and they told the greatness of a god or hero and how he came to extend his protection to the community and saved it from disaster in times long past. By 5th century BC, Greek tragedy contained two different elements. Solemn tragedy concerned solely with the sufferings and sorrows of heroes and historical personages. And the satiric drama termed by the Greeks Sportive tragedy concerned solely with Dionysus and his satyrs. Dear students, Dionysus was regarded by the Greeks as a hero as well as a god. The Athenian theatre focused on him. He was the god of fertility, wine, agriculture and sexuality. Athenians had an annual fertility festival in March with one week of wine drinking and phallus worshipping religious orgy. Their religious rite was performed as a didirambos, an ancient dance and chant to the fertility god, normally performed while drunk. It was performed outside in bowl-like craters. This festival celebrated the birth of the wine god Dionysus and the great grapes that made the wine. It was performed yearly at four tribal festivals called an orgia. The religious rites for these ceremonies were eventually written down in verse form and later became plays. This worship was of a twofold character corresponding to the different conceptions which were anciently entertained of Dionysus as a changeable god of flourishing, decaying or renovated nature and the various fortunes to which he was considered to be subjected to at the different seasons of the year. Hence, dear friends, the festival of Dionysus at Athens and elsewhere were all solemnized coincidentally with the changes going on in the course of nature and by his worshippers conceived the God himself to be affected. His mournful or joyous fortunes, his mystical death symbolizing the death of all vegetation in the winter and his birth indicating the renovation of all nature in the spring and his struggles in passing from one state to another were not only represented by the dithyrambic singers and dancers but they also carried people's enthusiasm so far as to fancy themselves under the influence of the same events as the God himself. In their attempts to identify themselves with him and his fortunes, they assumed the character of the subordinate divinities 
the satyrs, nymphs and pains who form the mythological train of the god. Can you now see how arose the custom of the disguise of satyrs being taken by the worshippers at the festivals of Dionysus? It is obvious that Grecian tragedy arose from choral songs and dances and was connected with the public rejoicings and ceremonies of Dionysus in cities. In fact, the very name of tragedy, far from signifying anything mournful or pathetic, is most probably derived from the goat-like appearances of the satyrs who sang or acted with mimetic gesticulations, the old Bacchic songs with Silenus, the constant companion of Dionysus. From their resemblances in dress and action to goats, their song was called the goat song. According to another opinion, the word tragedy was first coined from the goat that was the prize for the best ode or song sung in the honor of Dionysus. Friends, the Dionysian Didirams were not always of a grey and joyous character. They were capable of expressing the extremes of sadness and wild lamentations as well as the enthusiasm of joy. And it was from the Didirambic songs of a mournful cast, probably sung originally in the winter months that the stately and solemn tragedy of the Greeks arose. It must be borne in mind, however, that in the most ancient times, the Didirambic song was not executed by a regular chorus. A crowd of worshippers under the influence of wine danced up to and around a blazing altar, led probably by a flute player the subject of the song being the birth and adventures of Dionysus. It is a reasonable conjecture that the Corypheus or leader of this irregular chorus occasionally assumed the character of the god himself, while the rest of the train or commerce represented his noisy band of thyrsus bearing followers. This is how tragedy took birth. Now we are going to trace the steps of its growth. The first improvement in the mode of performing the Didiram was introduced by Orion, a celebrated man of Mithimna in Lesbos. He is generally admitted to have been the inventor of the cyclic chorus in which the Didiram was danced after a more regular fashion around the blazing altar by a band of 50 men or boys to a lyric accompaniment. The idea seemed to have been borrowed by him from the Dorian choral odes along with their regular lyric movements. Orion travelled extensively in the Dorian states of Hellas and had ample opportunities of observing the varieties of choral worship and of introducing any improvement which he might wish to make in it. Previous to the time of Orion, the leaders of the wild irregular commerce which danced the Didiram bewailed the sorrows of Dionysus or commemorated his wonderful birth in spontaneous effusions accompanied by suitable action for which they trusted to the inspiration of the wine cup. This is the meaning of Aristotle's assertion that this primitive tragedy was extemporaneous. Orion, however, by composing regular poems to be sung to the lyre 
at once raised the dithiram to a literary position and laid the foundation of the stately superstructure which was afterwards erected. He also turned the commerce or the moving crowd of worshippers into a standing chorus. He was the inventor of the tragic style too. That means that he introduced a style of music or harmony adapted to and intended for a chorus of satyrs. Next in order was Thespis, the celebrated contemporary of Pisistratus, to whom the invention of Greek tragedy has been generally ascribed. He was born at Icaria, an Attic deem, at the beginning of the 6th century BC. Thespis is said to have introduced an actor for the sake of affording an interval of rest for the Dionysian chorus. The actor answered as it were the songs of the chorus. This actor was generally perhaps always the poet himself. He invented a disguise for the face by means of a pigment prepared from the herb purslane and afterwards constructed a linen mask in order probably that he might be able to sustain more than one character. He is also said to have introduced some important alterations into the dances of the chorus and his figures were known in the days of Aristophanes. He did not however as an actor confine his speech to mere narration. He addressed it to the chorus which carried on with him a sort of dialogue through its leader. In early days the tragic chorus and its dithyrams were only performed on the occasion of festivals at sacred spots. Thespis detached his chorus and dithyram from some particular shrine possibly at Icaria, his native place and taking his company with him on wagons gave his performances on an extemporized stage when and where he could find an audience not for religious purposes but for pastime and for gain. Thus not merely by defining more accurately the role of the actor but by lifting tragedy from being a mere piece of religious ritual tied to a particular spot into the greatest form of literature he was the true founder of tragic art. The custom introduced by Thespis was continued by Phrynichus. Had the chorus taken up an active and independent part, it would have left its original and characteristic sphere. Aeschylus in consequence added a second actor so that the action and the dialogue became now independent of the chorus and the dramatist at the same time had an opportunity of showing two persons in contrast with each other on the stage. A third actor was added by Sophocles. A fourth actor except perhaps in Oedipus Colonius was never added. If a fourth character had to be introduced, one of the three persons on the stage retired and came in again personifying this fourth one. Any number of mutes, however, might appear upon the stage. In the plays of Aeschylus, we see the lyric and the dramatic existing side by side. And the drama did not succeed in making the song subservient. In the plays of Sophocles, we find the lyric fused with the dramatic, welded into it made helpful to the tragic story. In the plays of Euripides, we discover that the chorus lingers 
like an atrophied organ which the dramatist dared not amputate out of regard for tradition. At the hands of Euripides, the chorus serves only to fill out the lyric interludes of the dramatic action. Greek tragedy had been lyrical in its origin and was perforce poetic. My dear students, tragedy for the Greeks did not have the same meaning it has for us. That is a play with an unhappy ending. True, most Greek tragedies do end unhappily with the central character involved in some sort of disaster. The protagonist struggles against fate and usually loses. But some of the greatest plays end in reconciliation. For example, the cycle of three plays known as the Oresteia trilogy by Aeschylus. The Greeks used tragedy rather in the sense of a serious treatment of some moral question as personified in characters of myth or legend. It was viewed as a form of ritual purification, Aristotle's catharsis, which gives rise to pathos or instructive suffering. It depicts the life voyages of people who steered themselves or who were steered by fate on collision courses with society, life's rules or simply fate. The tragic protagonist is one who refuses out of either weakness or strength to acquiesce to fate. What for us now might better be described as the objective realities of life. Most often the protagonist's main fault is hubris, a Greek and English word meaning false or overweening arrogance. It could be the arrogance of not accepting one's destiny as in Oedipus Rex. The arrogance of assuming the right to kill, example Agamemnon or the arrogance of assuming the right to seek vengeance, example Orestes. Whatever the root cause, the protagonist's ultimate collision with fate, reality or society is inevitable and irrevocable. Tragedy did not develop in a vacuum. It was an outgrowth of what was happening at the time in Athens. On one hand, Greek religion had dictated how people should behave and think for centuries. On the other, there was birth of free thought and intellectual inquiry. Athens in the 4th and 5th centuries BC was bustling with radical ideas like democracy, philosophy, mathematics, science and art. It boasted philosophers like Plato, Socrates, Aristotle, Epicurus and Democritus and the first known historians Thucydides and Herodotus. There were the scientists and mathematicians like Thales, Hippocrates, Archimedes and later Euclid, Pythagoras, Eratosthenes, Hero, Hipparchus and Ptolemy. In these respects there was a blossoming of free thought after years of religious dicta. This is how ancient Athens became a nursery for the flowering of tragedy. Thank you.